Good evening, everyone. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder with the National Weather Service. You're watching Alaska Weather tonight uh, here on the 28th of March. Thanks for joining us again for your latest weather information from the National Weather Service. You can always get this information any way you like on the phone, 1-800-472-0391, online at weather.gov slash Alaska, which can lead you off to your general aviation forecast from the Alaska Aviation Weather Unit. Or if you're starting to think about breakup a little bit, uh, the place to bookmark and check out would be weather.gov slash APRFC. That's the Alaska Pacific River Forecast Center for short. Those links will be on the webpage there. And when we get into breakup, because we're not there yet, but soon, uh, you'll be able to find up the breakup map, the spring flood outlook, and, and all those really important links that you want to track if you're on the Cusco or if you're on the Yukon, on the Tanana, all of our favorite rivers, you can get information during that time. But again, we're not there yet, even though it's starting to feel and look a little bit more like spring. And if you can't find what you want, please let me know. David.Snyder at NOAA.gov is the easy way to find me, and I'm happy to return your emails as quickly as I can. Uh, you know, send me a picture of what's going on in your village or how things look on your favorite Alaska view. Tell me what you see, and uh, maybe we'll get it up here on the show. Here's what we saw today. Take a look at this. Here's a little bit of gee whiz fun for you today. This is from the Alaska Sea Ice Program, and you're looking at the North Slope. Here's Kaktovik, the eastern Beaufort Sea Coast, and a little bit further to the west, Prudhoe Bay. And if you look really carefully, it's a little hard to see, but right here in this curve, that is the North Slope's coastline all the way out toward Harrison Bay. I'm going to step out of the way here because it gets a lot better if I'm not in the picture. Uh, look at that. That movement is sea ice. And we got a glimpse of this over the course of several hours from uh, several uh, different satellites uh, giving us uh, some rapid scan of the area. And that broad easterly flow is pushing and fracturing the ice. Now, if you look really carefully, well, here's Kaktovik once again. And watch this crack just move very sharply all the way down the coastline there. There's a huge swath of ice that's actually fracturing while we watch. Pretty cool stuff considering this is happening way above, uh, uh, above the Earth. So the really cool thing is this is one of the, the older satellites, pretty sure. And as we get the newer satellite technology in place over Alaska, we're going to have a much better opportunity to see more events like this happening on a finer scale, finer resolution, easier to see, and we're going to add in a whole lot of other things to it too, like lightning tracking from the satellite, which is really going to help the forecasters around Alaska, help keep people safe, and we'll be able to share more cool stuff like this with you uh, as we see it. So, uh, pretty cool stuff. If you want to check this out again, you know, show the kids, you know, bring this up in the school or something. Weather.gov slash Anchorage slash ice is how you can find this image. It's on the ice page today. So once again, uh, a pretty decent sea ice uh, pack fracture today happening as that moves from east to west. Pretty cool stuff. Almost looks like a lightning bolt uh, moving across the ice surface there. Wow, gee whiz. Let's take a look at the satellite picture here, kind of in its standard form now. This is a tracking clouds on an infrared basis. And uh, you can see over the last couple days that things have been quieting down around a lot, large part of Alaska. We still have this flow working its way across southern parts of southeast. The generally dry conditions, still a little bit of light rain there. The concern, though, going forward is going to be as temperatures cool down, what do you get? Do you get fog or is it going to cool off enough that you get frost? And if it's cold enough that you're going to get that frost there, the other concern now is all those wet surfaces in parts of southeast are going to be a little more slippery than they have been the last couple of days. So be careful in southeast. You've had a little bit of everything the last couple of days there, and it uh, looks like uh, temperatures will be cooling off tonight. Out to the west, you can see high pressures really taking charge of the Aleutians here. Uh, did you see the marine forecast yesterday for today and tomorrow? Things are really quieting down. This is a decent high pressure system, about 1,040 millibars. So seas are getting uh, pretty small, the winds are pretty light, uh, a little bit on the unusual side for the illusions, uh, especially uh, considering it's still, it's still winter slash springish, kind of smart, I guess you could say. 
Out across the west, uh, you see the main storm path is, is still coming in from the western Bering Sea. A lot of this activity is going to be moving northward, so we'll be keeping our eye up around the Chukchi and the Bering Strait going forward. We've still got some spotty areas of snow, and there will be continued areas of light snow across the interior through today and really the next couple days. So high pressure is set up across the eastern part of the interior. We've got a weak wave of low pressure down across the eastern gulf. Still a little bit of light rain again across southeast and some light snow and even some rain across the interior and light rain around Birchwood earlier today. As we head into tonight, watch for some pockets of light snow. It doesn't look like it's going to be anything monumental there. Nothing that uh, warnings, watches, or advisories are posted for. So kind of garden variety snowfall out there. Uh, looks like we will see fog around Bristol Bay all the way across the southern bearing and into the central bearing south and west of St. Matthew and the Pribilovs. A trough of low pressure will sit right across the north slope. We were watching that sea ice move just a little while ago. And that may help to keep a breeze going across some of the northern areas. So don't be surprised if you see a little bit of blowing snow, but not a whole lot. And across the west, rainfall across the western bearing. That creeps eastward on Thursday as a frontal boundary sneaks a little bit further closer to the illusions. Not too much, though. High pressure still in charge. That means uh, light winds and small seas will continue. And uh, there's probably going to be some fog out there across the western edge. Look for areas of light snow in the interior. Most of that's going to be north of the Alaska Range for areas in south central. Don't be too surprised to see a little more clouds than anything else. Most of southeast should be dry. In fact, you might get a little more sunshine tomorrow, but just to the south, Ketchikan, Craig, Klawak, uh, probably into Hyder, you probably be looking at a little bit of light rain, maybe some drizzle from time to time. And we will have this trough stretching out across the northern Gulf there, helping to keep that offshore flow going. As we get into your Friday, notice that northern storm is really starting to push that boundary a little bit further east and into the Bering Strait region. Because of that, there's probably an increasing risk for some snow. You might even get a little bit of that on Thursday in Savunga, out toward Gamble. And the winds are going to pick up around the Kobuk and Noatak Valleys, the Chukchi Coast into Kotzebue Sound. Watch for those winds to come up. And that could mean some blowing snow there, depending on how much you have on the ground. And the same goes for the Barrow region. Not a whole lot of falling snow for the north slope. Maybe a few pockets there as you get uh, north of Anaktuvik Pass. For the central and eastern interior, uh, light snow is still a, a possibility as you head into Friday. But high pressure is really going to try and keep things fairly dry for west and southwestern Alaska and keep the offshore wind going through Cook Inlet. So not a really great chance of precipitation in south central. For southeast, still pretty dry. Most of the, the best chances of precipitation slide to your south and east. And for the Gulf, uh, periods of rain and snow showers may form really on an isolated basis around this weak area of low pressure that's just kind of stuck out there in the middle of the water. So for the meantime, it looks like uh, the Aleutians will be uh, fair and dry. However, Notice this pressure gradient is really starting to pack in here. This is a decent high pressure system and all the weather is kind of moving around it and trying to break this down. And until that happens, the winds on the periphery of this will start to pick up a little bit more. So we're seeing that on the north side and we're seeing that on the south side. And eventually we'll probably see that on the east side as well. So changes are always happening and uh, that's one to watch for as we go into the weekend. Here's a look at temperatures today and for tonight. Uh, upper 20s to mid 30s for most of southeast. Uh, many areas, though, on an isolated basis probably will drop below freezing, so one to watch would be around the capital city there, and watch for slick spots as you're moving around tomorrow. Upper 20s and lower 30s for South Central, Prince William Sound, Kodiak Island about 31, Middle Tananaw Valley and Fairbanks about 11, the North Slope anywhere from 5 to 10 below, so still cold stuff up there. 10 to 15 degrees around Kotzebue Sound out toward Ambler, Bettles uh, a little bit closer to uh, 10 degrees there down toward Tananaw and McGrath, the mid to upper teens, southwestern coast, back in the mid to upper 20s, and the Alaska Peninsula on the chain, back in the lower 30s there with St. Paul at 29, a high of 37 for you tomorrow. 27 in Nome or so, looking at about uh, 23 in Cottesville, 11 in Barrow, uh, the middle Tananaw Valley and Fairbanks uh, could be closer to freezing tomorrow, south central nearing 40 degrees. 43 around Kodiak, Sand Point about 40 as well. Southeast back in the mid 40s, Yakutat about 42. Overnight low temperatures for your Friday morning. Upper 20s and lower 30s again in southeast. South Central in the teens and 20s, 33 for Kodiak. McGrath about 8. The middle Tanana Valley back in the mid teens. Barrow 3, Kaktobik 2, Prudhoe Bay and Dead Horse about the same. 17 in Nome, uh, 19 in Shishmaref. It looks like Nunavak Island, you're about 23 around Macquarie. And uh, areas around southwest back in the mid 20s, 20s and 30s for the Alaska Peninsula and 29 in St. Paul with a high there of 36 on Friday. Uh, the middle Tanana Valley up toward North Pole and Fairbanks, 32 degrees south central again, just shy of 40 degrees for many locations. 41 around Cordova, lower 40s for many in southeast. A catch a cannon and that could warm up into the mid 40s. The North Slope back in the lower to mid teens.
And now, aviation weather around Alaska. On to your aviation weather now. IFR conditions are expected to be fairly widespread across the interior, but some noticeable areas that will be generally clear. Some of those around the Fairbanks area in the morning. Uh, look for some low clouds and maybe some areas of fog across some parts of the western interior. Uh, southwest looking for IFR, and some of that will stretch all the way up toward the Chukchi coast. Uh, where as you look at the Seward Peninsula, some areas of MVFR across Nome, out towards St. Lawrence Island, St. Matthew, down toward the Priblovs, and then fairly widespread VFR just north and along that high pressure ridge that's sitting across the Aleutians, keeping things pretty still right now. IFR is also going to stretch outside of the Dixon entrance and west of Haida Gwaii and Craig and Klawak. Otherwise, northward you get into MVFR all the way up to the capital city, and once you get up toward Haines and Skagway, Pelican, uh, Huna, things should be improving a little bit more toward VFR, and you'll see a great improvement as we head through the remainder of your Thursday afternoon in southeast. Across the interior, VFR will pretty much take over the Kuskokwim Valley, most of the Yukon Valley, north and west up toward uh, Ambler, uh, No Attack, and the Kobuk Valleys. You'll see some hit and miss IFR, mainly widespread MVFR, and the north slope looks to improve as we get into the afternoon. And then MVFR will be the, the main issue as we head out across the west coast and most of the Bering Sea in the chain. Friday morning, we're back into the low clouds and the low ceiling as we get into the afternoon. It uh, doesn't look like it's going to last all day, though, because once again, as we get into the afternoon, you see a pretty widespread improvement across the region, but a little bit more of a blanket of MVFR lingering through the afternoon there. Southeast expects to be VFR again through fr Friday afternoon, then the Chukchi Coast into Kotzebue Sound, maybe hit and miss IFR there. And you can see a little bit of IFR developing just south and west of the chain as we get toward the end of the week. Let's take a look at your pass conditions in detail now for your Thursday. Anaktuvik and Adigan Pass, we expect to see IFR to start there with MVFR uh, by the afternoon. So some improvement noted there for Thursday, and it looks like a repeat again on Friday. Lake Clark and Merrill Pass, we expect to see IFR to start your day. Uh, marginal conditions as we go through the afternoon there. Rainy Pass and IFR start. Again, some improvement through the afternoon and pretty much a wash, rinse, and repeat as we get into Friday. Windy Pass, I uh, expect IFR to start, but a lot more improvement the further east you go. Uh, through the rest of these passes. VFR is expected there for the afternoon. The same goes for Isabel Pass, so kind of a low start as we get going there on Thursday. Mentasta Pass looking for IFR to start there, and then VFR improvement for the afternoon. Tanita Pass probably uh, quickly turning over to VFR by the mid to late afternoon hours. Portage Pass also expected to return to visual flight rule by the end of the day. And Chilkoot and White Pass look pretty good pretty much most of the day. South of that, though, watch out, you'll hold on to MVFR for a while. Freezing levels indicate that there is some elevated warmth just south of the Dixon entrance. Levels quickly climb from two to 8,000 feet as you head toward the Pacific Northwest. Most of the state, though, remains below freezing in the morning. And way out west, you can see the next hints of the next weather maker working into the North Pacific and Western Bering as levels climb to about two to 4,000 feet. Icing potential remains pretty limited. Uh, most of that's above about two to 4,000 feet for the interior, especially the Northwest, uh, still holding on to some of that warmth that uh, was generated from the last wave uh, that came up from the south, and uh, so we're still holding on to a little bit of moisture there, as well as uh, levels that are a little bit off the ground. So the substantial icing potential really not present here. Uh, this is an isolated moderate risk across the northwest and most of the south and central and western interior. Uh, those levels there anywhere from about three to 4,000 feet as you head out into the Bering and eastern Russia and the Gulf of Anadir. That includes St. Lawrence Island. And then down south, uh, the extreme southern part of southeast, uh, the Dixon entrance region, uh, generally above 8,000 feet is where you're going to find that risk developing for you. The jet stream has our high pressure core now up across the Beaufort Sea Coast. That's drawing in that coldest air and shunting that off into western Canada. Uh, as we look westward, you see the wind speeds coming up to about 60 to 90 knots, a ridge developing here across the bearing, and winds coming down the west coast around 60 knots, and then picking up speed coming into southeast around 110 knots from the west and southwest. At 3,000 feet, we have a weak disturbance near Prince William Sound. Winds are generally light, though, across the interior, about 10 to 15 knots or so, and mostly following that westerly trajectory coming in across the Bering Sea. Uh, Norton Sound looking at 15 knot winds, a little faster flow across the Gulf, but really nothing too much to write home about today. At 3,000 feet, uh, winds are a little bit more organized here in the west. You can see winds quickly coming up to about 15 to 50 knots across the western bearing, but high pressures really put a, a big kibosh on things across the Alaska Peninsula and Bristol Bay. Light northerlies coming across south central, low pressure here wrapping in some winds. Uh, mainly an offshore flow for most of central and northern parts of southeast. One reason you're going to have a generally clear sky. And uh, temps, uh, wind speeds up north anyway, about 10 to 20 knots from the west and southwest. So a quick check of turbulence shows nothing. 
Things look pretty good there for your Thursday, so smooth sailing all the way around. Back with a look at your Marines here in just a few minutes. Welcome back to another edition of Alaska Weather Facts. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder, and joining us once again is Eric Stevens, our good friend from GINA, the Geographic Information Network of Alaska, based up at UAF. And thanks for joining us, Eric. Really appreciate it. Oh, happy to be here, Dave. And we love to hear about all the fascinating developments, and new and old, and how the, we're using the tools here, especially around Alaska. And mm -hmm. I've got to think that, you know, satellite meteorology right now is a, a fascinating time to be involved in. If we go back to the first satellite, uh, was Tyros, back in 1960, I think is when we got some of those first pictures, uh, weather and meteorology probably changed that day for a whole lot of people, and it's mm -hmm. still changing today, right? Oh, you know it. Satellite imagery is so important, and it's getting better all the time. Yeah. Of course, never perfect, but especially for us in Alaska, where there are other data sets like radars and mm -hmm. weather balloons are so thinly spread, right. the satellite is the great equalizer because the satellite sees everything. Right. Yeah. Right. We've got one particular um, issue in volcanic ash detection. That's a big deal here. Yeah. You know it. If you fly an airplane into volcanic ash, uh, your jet engine might just fail. And, right. and an airplane without engines is in a world of hurt. Sure. So if there's a volcano that goes off, Satellite imagery is the way to track that plume of ash mm -hmm. and to tell pilots this is where you need to not be right. to avoid this ash plume. And uh, there's a, a phrase out there, what's the difference? What's you know, the what's difference? the difference? Okay. Well, it turns out, what we're going to discuss today, that the difference is everything. There's a technique called channel differencing. Okay. That if you take one piece of the spectrum of what the satellite detects, and a slightly different wavelength of that spectrum, even though those two images might look similar, magical things happen when you subtract one from the other huh. and they reveal information that was already there, but it was hard to find until you did that subtraction. That sounds like Nicolas Cage in National Treasure when he's got those fancy glasses <laughs> and he's flipping one up and back and forth. I mean, is this what we're talking about? Look, look. Let's go more highbrow and talk okay. Michelangelo. Oh, so okay. apparently Michelangelo <laughs> made some amazing sculpture yeah. and someone said, Michael, that's amazing. How did you do it? Mm -hmm. And Michelangelo's reply allegedly was, well, you know, in that rock, the statue was already in there. Right. I just scraped away the unnecessary bits. In satellite meteorology, yeah. sometimes there are meteorological features that are in the data, but you can't see it until you combine or difference some of the channels. Okay. When we've got a case, good old uh, Pavlov volcano right. goes off now and then. Sure. And uh, you can observe directly uh, a picture of the volcano. You know, just take it with your iPhone. Yeah. You can see a volcano going off. Yep. Right. But if you want to get the broad view, we need satellite mm -hmm. to do that. Now, there are a couple of wavelengths that we can look at. Wait. So what's a wavelength? What that's, a wavelength? The, yeah. that's the amount of space between a peak and a valley and another peak uh, in a certain part of the electromagnetic spectrum. We're going to look at 12 micron wavelength wow. and 10.8 micron wavelength. What is a micron? So what's a micron? Yeah, we're getting into the geek department now. A <laughs> micron is a unit of length, and it is quite tiny. We're looking at what's called long wave uh, wavelengths, okay. but it takes 25,000 of these microns to make an inch, yeah. a human Whoa. blood cell is about five microns across. So when we're talking about 12 micron imagery as allegedly long wave, well, that's relative. Pretty too. short for light. Yeah, yeah. it's the other part okay. of the, uh, it's, it's just a, an expression for the, the spectrum there. Okay. So we can look at a, at a 12 micron image, say a satellite image. At 12 microns, we're seeing a heat signature here, really. And, and the way this color enhancement works is the, the yellow and the red stuff is, is high, cold clouds down mm -hmm. here over the Gulf of Alaska into South Central. And if you were, set, you were asked, where do you find the uh, volcanic ash plume in this image? Hey, where do you find the volcanic plume in this image? Eric? It's hard to do. I'm yeah. not sure I could find it. If you, <laughs> if you were to look at this image and just say, show me the, what, you, what jumps out at you here, I'd say, well, n nothing really. Well, let's okay. look. So 12 micron doesn't help us. Okay. Let's look at 10.8 microns. All right. All right, look at that. It's practically the same image. So mm. where's this volcanic ash? Can't find it at 12 microns, can't really see it at, at 10.8. Mm -hmm. But when we take subtract one channel from the other, oh. magically, the huh. plume appears. The color enhancement here yeah. uh, highlights the ash in blue. Wow. The data, the information was already there, but we couldn't find it until we subtracted one channel from another. Very it's, interesting. It's almost magical. 
Similarly, let's say you're looking for fog up on the north slope. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a foggy neighborhood. Sure. Um, in 11 micron and 3.9 micron, we've got a 3.9 micron image here. Um, it's a big fuzzy blur over Barrow. We, mm -hmm. we can't see where the fog is. But the information is lurking in there waiting for us to, to reveal it. All we have to do is find that difference between the 11 micron and the 3.9, and then this image huh. becomes this image, and the fog bank jumps right out, and you can see it up there at Barrow. Now, every you got to choose the right tool for the job, sure. like they say. You open your right. toolbox, all kinds of stuff in there. Mm -hmm. What do we need for this particular task? If you want to find volcanic ash, we look at 12 and 10.8 micron, find that difference. If you want okay. to find fog, we'll look at 11 and 3.9 micron, find that difference. It's great, different tools for different jobs. Of course, there's always caveats and gotchas, but this <laughs> fog procedure, yeah. it only works at night, because when the sun oh. comes up, it, it gets in the way. Um, so every product has its strengths and limitations, and in meteorology, the challenge is using the right tool for the right job, and these are some of those tools. And discovery is still happening, even with meteorology. The weather's been around for a long time, but the yeah. tools that are being developed to understand the meteorology is a fascinating and still very new science. It's, a, it's such a young science. We've come so far. I'm getting old enough now that I can literally <laughs> say that, you know, when I was a boy, we didn't have this kind of thing. Uh -huh. and, and there's new things happening all the time. New satellites will be launched in coming years that will have better instruments than ever before. It's an exciting time, and this is so helpful for Alaska because satellites mm -hmm. help fill in the gaps between other ways obser of the observing the weather. Satellites are the great equalizer for Alaska. Yeah, and help so many people stay safe in so many ways every you know day it. up here in the last frontier. Yeah, it's what it's all about, protecting lives and property. Well, thank you so much for joining us again, Eric. We love to hear about this fascinating information, mm -hmm. and uh, boy, it just makes me want to go watch satellite pictures all day. So <laughs> hopefully sure we're inspiring more people to do the same thing, and uh, just be curious. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. Thanks for joining us for another edition of Alaska Weather Facts, and we'll see you next time. And now, marine weather around Alaska. Time for a quick check of your sea ice edge on this 28th of March, and you'll notice there are uh, several other areas of leads and uh, polinias forming, uh, mainly along the north coast of uh, the YK Delta, uh, Seward Peninsula, and along the Chukchi Coast. And where we were watching that animation of the sea ice, that was uh, right here along this boundary here, so you're not going to really see a whole lot of that resolution without zooming in tremendously, but you can do that. If you go to weather.gov slash anchorage slash ice, you can make your own customizable map there and uh, kind of pick apart the different uh, features that you see here on the ice map in both concentration and in thickness there. And uh, so a lot of changes uh, generally along the south and western coast there. Uh, just because of the high pressure system, a lot of that probably won't change a whole lot in the next couple days. However, we are watching that western bearing storm work its way north and east, and so we would expect more changes as we get into Friday and Saturday there, especially in the northern side. Here's a look at Thursday's forecast in southeast. Remember, we've got that trough of low pressure sitting right across the region. Because of that, a gentle north and northwesterly flow in the inside passages and along the outer coast, 10 to 20 knots there in general. About 5 to 8 foot seas across the outside, uh, 4 to 5 foot seas on the inside for Thursday. For Friday, a little bit more of a northerly wind in the Lynn Canal, 25 knots and 5 foot seas there. Compare that to 10 knots and 2 foot seas inside of the Clarence Strait. And we still keep that uh, flow going parallel to the outer coast, 15 to 20 knots there, 7 to 8 foot seas. But we generate more of an easterly flow from Yakutat westward, 10 to 15 knots there and 6 to 7 foot seas on Friday. Prince William Sound, uh, 15 knots and 2 foot seas there, that coming in from the west. Otherwise, northerlies across most of the uh, northern uh, Gulf and 10 knots there for most of Cook Inlet. Uh, two to six foot seas there, uh, down around the Barrens higher seas. Of course, notice that the ice is not part of this forecast anymore. We're up to two foot seas now for most of the inlet. For Friday, not a big change there across the inlet. Still small seas and north and westerlies coming across the Barrens about 25 knots. Light winds, small seas across Prince William Sound and across the northern Gulf outside of Resurrection Bay, 15 knots and five foot seas there. For the Bristol Bay region, remember we've got a huge area of high pressure sitting out here, so we're not going to see a whole lot of wind, not going to see a lot of big waves out there. Uh, south winds about 10 knots with 2 foot seas. Light winds across Shellacoff Strait, 15 knots and 4 foot seas and 4 to 5 foot seas elsewhere across the Pacific Coast for your Friday. Really more of the same. Winds pick up a little bit more just east of Kodiak Island, 20 knots and 6 foot seas there. A light north wind inside of Bristol Bay, northeasterlies down the Bering Sea coast and north and northeasterly winds down the Pacific coast up to 15 knots and 5 to 6 foot seas there. The Aleutians once again controlled by that monster ridge across the south and eastern part of the Bering. Gen 
internal easterly flow on the south side of that 15 to 25 knots, um, slightly higher seas there. Remember, we were watching the surface charts and we saw that pressure band starting to constrict here. We're going to start to see some faster moving winds here over the next couple of days, but generally on the Pacific side there, most areas in the Bering are still going to have uh, I wouldn't say flat seas, but certainly smaller seas there. And you'll notice that southerly wind kind of changing course there from Kiska to Shemya as that western storm starts to increase a little bit. We'll still have more of an east and southeasterly flow on Friday. Uh, easterlies across the central and eastern chain is faster winds, higher seas across the Pacific, of course, 10 to 13 foot seas there compared to 5 to maybe 11 foot seas across the Bering Sea coast for your Friday. For the west coast, that uh, high pressure center is just to the south and west. We're into a little bit more of a north and westerly flow here. You can see things changing just a little bit here across the Yukon Delta. 10 to 15 knot winds on a two foot sea. So pretty small around St. Matthew. Five foot seas there. Light northerlies around St. Paul and St. George. As you get into Friday, you can see some of the changes taking shape out in the west. Uh, higher seas and swells coming in. 15 to 30 knots with three to 12 foot seas developing. Three foot seas on either side of Nunavak Island, a little bit smaller seas out towards St. Paul and St. George, and southerlies over Norton Sound. For the North Slope, light winds across the region, five to ten uh, knots there, otherwise 20 knots across the Chukchi coast, again still covered with ice. As we get into Friday, uh, the winds start to pick up a little bit more from the south and the west, still light winds around Kaktovik at five knots, but winds around the Chukchi coast in the Bering Strait coming up to 25 to 30 knots, all coming in pretty much from the south. Recapping tonight's weather, high pressure is really the big player now across the southern Bering Sea. Watch for areas of fog there across southwest Bristol Bay, the Yukon and Kuskokwim Delta, all the way out across the Bering there. Uh, further west, a developing storm across eastern Asia will make its way toward the Bering Strait as we go toward Friday and Saturday, so watch for that. In the meantime, a weak wave of low pressure sitting across southern parts of southeast, still slinging a little bit of rain there. Things are drying out and cooling down, so watch for slick spots, especially across the northern half of southeast tonight. Uh, fog and frost could be part of your morning. Areas of light snow across the interior, a few snow showers a little bit further out west. Nothing too substantial there as we go into your uh, Thursday, Friday, the storm starts to work toward the Bering Strait, and we'll watch for some more wind across northwestern parts of Alaska and a little bit of light snow across the interior. These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go flying. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbormaster before you go boating.